Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I would just like to say two things. Um, uh, I've been away for a month in Zambia, and there are those among you here who prayed for us, prayed for me in particular with very long bus journeys in Africa. And I'm very, very grateful for your prayers, and God really helped me and kept me safe and blessed in the two remote uh, village conferences that I spoke at there. Um, but I would also like to say this, in a very remarkable answer to prayer, actually, which goes back three years at least, uh, God has granted Ian Thompson, my friend, and I uh, visas to go to Pakistan in two weeks' time, uh, which, uh, you know, when you know that Ian has been refused three times, uh, it's quite wonderful that God, I knew, we. I, I felt strongly that God wanted us there this year, but it's wonderful, actually, that we both got the um, the visas. Um, and among other things, there is a school there that was started by two of our folks who can't be here very much because they're, um, they're not well. Kadima Nagina started the school. It's struggling along, and I am... Um, looking forward to taking some money out to that school. If there are any here who'd like to give any money, uh, I don't want to detract from the Ganesh poor giving, but this is just a, in, in 12 days time when I fly, I would love to be able to take um, some more money to help that school. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I'm, um, I've been asked to speak on one of Paul's great sermons to Jewish people in uh, what today is Turkey, it was called Antioch in those days, and I think, I believe it's called Antakya today. It's, you can find it in uh, southern central Turkey today. Um, it's Acts chapter 13. I've got, it's a little bit of a longer reading than normal, um, but it's necessary for me to read most of this, and then I want to focus on... Um, the, the approach that Paul has to Jewish religious people. So this is Acts 13, and he went into the synagogue, and uh, I, I'm going to start at verse 16. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand. It must have been a particular way of, in the Jewish custom, of indicating that you're about to say something important. He motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct. And I want to point out that the word used in the original there means he bore, he bore with them. And it has the possible meaning there that he cared for them. It, that, that could be another meaning there. I just want to point that out. Uh, we'll look at that in a minute. He, uh, in the wilderness, he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people at, uh, as their inheritance. And all this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. And then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I'm not the one you're looking for. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross 
and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him up from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, the children, by raising up Jesus. Now, we then, I'm cutting this re reading slightly short. There are a number of references then to prophecies in the Old Testament, um, Psalm 2 and some other uh, from the Psalm 16. So I'm going to jump to 34, uh, 36. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So take care that what the prophets have said to you will not happen to you. And he warns them about taking this message lightly. Now, today, my job is to speak about good news. I've called it for the religious. And uh, yeah, there we are. You'll, you'll get some few headlines coming up here. Jesus' last command to his disciples was go into all the world, every ethnic group, and preach the good news to everyone, baptizing them, teaching them all things that I commanded. And there was a strategy to, to this, and the great apostle Paul makes it clear in Romans, the first of the, the letters which comes in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God to salvation, first of all for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. And in all his mission work, wherever Paul went, he first of all sought out the Jews. And so he, he, he went to see if there was a synagogue in the place. And he would go there, attend on the Sabbath, which obviously is a Saturday, and often he'd be asked to say something. And that's exactly what happened here in Antioch in uh, modern Turkey. Um, the Jews have been scattered all over the place. There were lots of Jews scattered, the diaspora of the Jews. Today, Jesus' command, of course, remains for us. It's very interesting. And I'm delighted to know, you know, that Pranita is heading up an outreach uh, to our local community around here. Go into all the world, to every ethnic group. Applies. Look at modern Britain. It's ethnically diverse. It's marvelous having this congregation here, which is ethnically diverse and comes from all sorts of different countries in origin, which is exactly what the kingdom of God is all about. Now, the issue is, what kind of strategy do you use for different groups? See, last Sunday, I spoke in a place called Kitwe in Zambia, and it's a religious culture, very religious culture. I was on a bus two weeks ago, and at quarter to four in the morning, we left at four in the morning, it was a long journey, up came a man with a red tie and a black suit, and he read a verse from the Bible, and he gave a very clear gospel message about the lost sheep, and God loves you, and uh, he, he gave a very powerful, clear message on that bus. Friends, that wouldn't happen on National Express in the UK. It's a different culture. It's very different. Now, Paul used different approaches for different cultures. And this one is his approach to the Jews. So let's have a look at it now. Let's have a look. The first thing we have to say is that whenever Paul spoke to the Jews, you had a history lesson. And it was a history, of course, of God's dealings with the Jews. It came from what we call the Old Testament, which the Jews would have called the Scriptures. That is the approach he used. And it's, this is not the only case in the book of Acts. Whenever Jews are addressed, 
you are looking at a, a, a history of God's dealings with his people. So let's have a look, his theme. By the way, the interesting thing is, for you and I, if we're not Jewish, and I don't think there are probably any Jewish people here, I don't know, but if we're not Jewish, we can just think, well, what's he getting at? But if you look more carefully, there is a point, there's a theme. So I want to say, what is the theme of the Apostle Paul in this address in the synagogue at Antioch. And I want to tell you, look in verse 17. We'll look at verse 17 here. Um, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper. With mighty power, he, lay, he, he led them out of the country. It's very interesting. In another address to the Sanhedrin, that was the Jewish parliament of the day, a great Christian leader called Stephen, he also gave a history lesson. But the point he's making is entirely different. He points out the, 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 the history that the Jewish people have of rejecting godly leaders. But actually, the point here is he completely ignores the tendency to sin and go off the tracks that the Jewish people had. He completely ignores that. The theme he's got is the mighty acts of God on behalf of his people to bless them. That's what it's all about. All the way, that's the only thing he focuses on. He ignores the rest. It's a highly selective journey through Jewish history. So very quickly, I'll read them out here. First of all, what did God, he chose our ancestors. That means Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the, the, the patriarchs. Secondly, he made them prosper in Egypt. Nothing about the suffering of slaves in Egypt. He made them prosper in Egypt. Thirdly, he manifested his power to bring them out of Egypt. Oh, there are lots of details there about the Red Sea and so on and so forth, but that's all summed up there. Then he cared for them for 40 years in the desert. And I think the emphasis here is probably more that he bore them up, bore them like on eagles' wings. We've got that description elsewhere. God's care and provision for them. In the desert, he overthrew seven Canaanite nations, and uh, they were able to enter in. He gave Israel leaders or judges. He gave them Saul as king, and then he gave them a man after his own heart, David. And now the greatest intervention in history is David's descendant, uh, the Savior Jesus. Now, I just want to point this out. The Christian faith, the Bible, it is not just a collection of ideas. It's not uh, a collection of tips on how to live a better life or even how to please God. It is fundamentally a history book. The Bible is fundamentally dealing with God acting in history. It's very, very important. Very interesting. Of course, a lot of people say, well, where's God when all this happens? Look at this terrible things that happen. Terrible things do happen all the time. Look at, look at uh, Ukraine now and so on. Where is God? We have to look at God's interventions in the history of his people specifically to see the hand of God in history. It's not the only place we look. I, I want to say one other thing here. The, the Bible then essentially is, is a history. It's very important that we realize that we're dealing with facts. There's a long history of people trying to say, no, 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 this is not facts at all. This is legends. And interestingly enough, the more that's discovered in archaeology, the more it points to these events in the Bible as being facts of history. The Christian faith is based on facts of history. It's very, very important. Secondly, we're only dealing with one ethnic group's history. We're dealing with the Jews. There are so many other ancient civilizations. What about the Chinese? Very, very ancient civilization. Many of you come from India. Very ancient civilization. And so on. Parts of Africa, ancient civilization and Europe, and so on and so forth. 
It's most interesting. Jesus had a conversation once with a foreigner from with a different religion, a woman who was a Samaritan from a different religion, and they ended up with a religious discussion about where a person should pray. She said, you pray in Jerusalem, we pray on this mountain. It was a religious discussion. And Jesus cut through it all. He said, you worship what you're not sure about. But salvation comes from the Jews. Very, very important statement. There is an ethnic side to the Christian faith. Salvation comes from the Jews. It doesn't come from any other ethnic group. Yes, everywhere in the world there are people who are seeking after God, very sincerely, in all sorts of ways. That's another subject altogether. But salvation comes from the Jews. It's extraordinary that God chose Abraham and his descendants. There's a long history with lots and lots of bumps on the road, and it ends up with Jesus, a Jew. So salvation does not come from the white man or the black man or the yellow man, etc., etc., the brown man. It comes from the Jews. Very, very important statement. That's where we must look for our salvation. Okay. And now we come to his core subject, of course, which is Jesus. And from verse 23 onwards, we're dealing with Jesus. And I've got three things to say here. Of course, Jesus is an historical figure. Uh, he, it's recorded not just in, in, in the Bible, of course. It's recorded in Roman and Jewish history, the fact of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, I've got three things to say here. In verse 24 and 25, um, Jesus truly is the Savior. I think so... Interesting that this week's life course, what day is it again, Clive? Tomorrow evening, you're looking at this very subject. Jesus is the Savior. There's no other. Jesus is the Savior. And uh, to underline that uh, to these Jewish people, Jesus refers to the last of the Old Testament prophets. He comes in the New Testament, but actually he's in the line of the Old Testament prophets. And his role is to tell the Jews, get ready, your Messiah is more or less here. He's coming right now. And actually, huge numbers responded to that and repented of their sins and uh, were baptized in the River Jordan. You know the story, lots of you, and so on. And then one day, in the huge crowd, he pointed out a man. He said, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His role was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And that is what we've got here. Jesus truly is the Savior. Um, my role is not to deal with the prophecies that deal with that, but it is a fact that Jesus fulfilled more, more or less 300 prophecies uh, concerning the Messiah. There is no one like him, absolutely unique in history. There is nobody remotely like Jesus in terms of the, the, the fact that he fulfilled all these prophecies. The second thing is his crucifixion and rejection. And, and this, of course, was a massive, massive problem and barrier for people believing that Jesus was the Messiah. How could God allow the Messiah to be mistreated as appallingly as Jesus of Nazareth was? It was very, very interesting, of course. Uh, some of you know very well that um, Muslims say that Jesus was not crucified, but someone else who looked very like him, and there are different suggestions, I think, as to who it could have been, uh, was crucified. But it's absolutely crucial and central to the whole Christian message that it was Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who went to the cross. He went deliberately to the cross. It, it, it was a huge, huge sacrifice 
of his, and he wrestled with the issue in his own soul in the Garden of Gethsemane. Some of you know that story um, ab uh, about that. And what, what is said here is the people of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross. They didn't realize. Isn't it interesting? Their motive was absolute hatred, inhuman jealousy and hatred. And they didn't realize they were fulfilling detailed prophecies concerning the Messiah, all being fulfilled there. The, the message to the Jews is this, listen, your Messiah has come. John the Baptist verifies it. And now the prophets verify it. The details of his crucifixion all verify it. And here comes the third and final thing. God raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 30 onwards. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. And again, I just want to emphasize this. Your faith and my faith, if we're Christians, finally does not rest on how we feel. We feel all sorts of things. Sometimes we feel near to God, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we feel failures, sometimes we don't. The Christian faith does not ultimately rest on how we feel. It rests on historical facts. Christ was crucified on the cross. He was raised the third day. He ascended into heaven. There were eyewitnesses. There were thousands or hundreds of eyewitnesses to all these events. Nothing was done in secret. And that's if you're not a believer yet here listening to me, I would encourage you, look at the New Testament. Look at the facts. God does not want you to believe in fairy stories. He wants you to believe what's true. And that is the whole point of Paul's message here to religious people. You need to realize, Jewish people, you've read the scriptures every Sabbath for centuries. It's all being fulfilled right now in your lifetime. Believe, and God will wonderfully bless you. Notice this, by the way, that the resurrection of Jesus was witnessed to by many different people. It, it's different from an hallucination. A classic hallucination um, is where in the same place, under the same circumstances, a person sees, it could be a figure, it could be Mary, it could be somebody, whatever. Someone else goes with them to the same place, and what do they see? Nothing at all. An hallucination is something that's happening in someone's head. It's not objective fact, it's happening there. The resurrection of Jesus is objective fact. And he, he knew they thought he was a ghost. He knew they found it difficult. So he said to them, listen, come and touch me. Prove to yourself it's me. Look at, look at the marks on my hands and feet. Has anyone got any food, he said. And so they had some boiled fish. And so he ate it to prove that he was a real person. He met them on different occasions under completely different circumstances. Large number, 500 people at once, sometimes just one, sometimes three, sometimes seven. Different numbers of people, often 12, and so on and so forth. But look at the facts. And so finally, the message of salvation is in verse 38. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. I think it's very significant he mentions the law of Moses there. Because, of course, there are many, many religious people trying to find peace with God, trying to find forgiveness of sins all over the world. And 
the, the, the one common thing is either a moral code they're following or a ritual code they're following. And of course, both of those are in the law of Moses. It's a moral law, the famous Ten Commandments, but there are also lots of rituals, the different um, sacrifices and the different feasts, three major ones and others as well. Rituals and morals, but it's all us climbing up a kind of metaphorical ladder trying to get to God. God's action in Jesus is actually you cannot make it. There's only one human being who's ever made the perfect standard of Almighty God, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. He kept the law perfectly in his heart. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. It's him. Salvation comes through him. His death on the cross deals with it atones for all our sins, small and great, things we don't know for long forgotten, and things that haunt us. All has been dealt with once for all on the cross. And that is why, folks, today, this is the first day of the week, Sunday, there are millions and millions of people around the world of all sorts of different cultural backgrounds who rejoice to know what exactly is promised here. Forgiveness of sins assurance of salvation, a relationship with God, and a transformation of their lives through Jesus Christ. And that is what is offered today to all. What is needed for it? And the answer is to all who will believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him as your personal savior, as your Lord and your God. And you will receive forgiveness of sins. You will receive because Christ has already achieved it. He's already got it for you, as it were. And he will transfer it to you. You put your faith in him. And that gift of forgiveness and transformation will come into your lives. Shall we pray? Almighty God, our dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we first of all want to say thank you, thank you, thank you that you have intervened again and again in the history of this world. We know the history of this world is littered with all sorts of terrible, terrible things and they're there in the Bible. But through it all, there's that wonderful golden thread of God's grace, God's purpose for humanity, to bring humanity back to himself. Thank you, Father, above all, for the gift of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that today he's at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thank you today he opens his arms and his heart to all who will call upon him and seek his mercy and forgiveness and grace. So, Lord, bless everyone here who's not yet received that, but desperately deep in their hearts and minds, they need that. Grant the grace today that people might even receive your salvation by faith in Jesus. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.